Today's guest is Jane L. Rosen, who is the author of four novels. She is from New York, and she has spent a lot of time on Fire Island. This was an island I knew nothing about, and it was fascinating to hear the story about Fire Island. So if you're unfamiliar with this island in New York, it's worth listening to this episode just to hear about that. But anyways, Jane has written four novels since she turned 50. She turned 50 and decided she wanted to write novels instead of be a screenwriter. I also didn't realize how different it is to be a screenwriter than a novelist. Fascinating stuff. The things we don't know when we don't know. Very, very different writing techniques and screenwriting just a little behind the scenes of what screenwriting is all about. That is interesting. But what I loved about Jane's story is how she always wanted to write. It's something that when you look back at her childhood, she loved to do. And often what we really love is something that we knew when we were a child. And sometimes Unlike Jane, sometimes we get turned down another path, another direction. But for Jane, she loved it and she stuck with it and she has done it all of her life, mostly, but in different ways. And she's really loving being a novelist and she's very good at it. Uh, and she has the these stories and she'll talk a little bit about the, the different books that she's written uh, but her latest one is is just out. And so, Jane, I think you're going to love Jane. I enjoyed immensely our conversation. She has three daughters. I have two daughters, a lot in common there. And she talks about how she wanted to write a novel, but she kept putting it off. And what's interesting is a time that was a very difficult time is actually the time that she decided to start writing her novel. And it's funny how when we get to these hard times in life, they lead us somewhere good. They lead us on a path that we're meant to walk when we think we're in such this difficult period and it's hard to see our way out of it. And the good news is that, guess what? She has now four books under her belt and the the issue, which I won't say, you have to listen to the episode, but the issue that led her to writing her first novel has now worked itself out. So isn't that great? So everything turned out in her best interest. The universe worked for her because I like to think that she was doing what she was meant to do. So listen in to yet another story of someone who is living a sparked second half. Here is Jane L. Rosen. Welcome to another episode of Living Your Sparked Second Half. With me today is Jane Rosen. Did I pronounce that right? I didn't ask you. I usually... Uh, it's Jane L. Rosen. If Jane you want to L. Rosen. <laughs> yes, she's an author and that L is important. So exactly. yes. You yes. find an artist in Jane Rosen, but an author in Jane L. Rosen. Yeah. Some people actually are pseudonyms. They have pseudonyms too that are completely different. So I, it's interesting how people do that, but maybe we'll get into that. So welcome to the show. I am excited to have you here. Jane's story is one of transition uh, and she's a novelist, a full-time novelist. I'm very excited to hear, hear about her book. She has four so yeah, welcome. Uh, yeah, tell me exactly uh, how you got started and and uh, how you transitioned and all that. Just introduce yourself. So I'm um, Jane Rosen, Jane L. Rosen. And um, I started out, I'd say I've had a second act and a third act, or maybe oh. a fourth act, a third act, a second act and a first act. But um, I started after having children I started writing screenplays. So I, I took a class and I learned how to write a screenplay and I sold my very first script to Miramax, which was pretty miraculous. Um, it was 
never as easy as it was the first time, but I was doing that for about 10 years and nothing, I sold things, but nothing ever got produced. So around the age of 50, I decided that the next idea that came into my head, I was going to write as a novel. Oh. And I did. Yeah. And screenwriting and no a novel is very different, right? People think, oh, it's rating, but it's very different. It's very different. It's very different. Um, my latest book, which I am the most proud of, is called On Fire Island. And that was originally a screenplay. Oh. So I waited till I really felt practiced and good enough to actually make it into a novel. And I, it just came out a couple of weeks ago. The difference is a screen, there's many differences. First of all, the first difference I would say is that when you write a book, it's your book. So you have an editor, but you like own the book. The book is always yours. Meaning you cannot get fired. You cannot, you know, they can't force you to make everyone aliens or to set it in Italy when it's set in New York. They could suggest things, but they can't make you do those things. In a screenplay, it's theirs. They're like renting the screenplay from you. Mm. And if they, you know, call you up and say, we love the story, but we'd like it to take place on Mars, you have to, unless you want to get fired and have someone else rewrite it, you have to write a story that takes place on Mars, even if your story took place in New York City. Now that's a big exaggeration, obviously, but those kind of things happen all the time with screenplays. Like, for example, when you're watching the movie Tootsie and you see at the end, 10 people wrote the movie, you think, oh, that must have been so much fun. 10 people standing around, sitting around, coming up with this great movie. It's not the case. They were each fired and another screenwriter was brought in. Ah. <laughs> yeah. So that to me is the biggest difference in the two you know, genres. I like writing screenplays because I love writing dialogue. And when you write a screenplay, you're basically writing dialogue. You set a scene, yeah, but the you scene set is it a briefly. Thing, yeah. yeah, you have to describe everything, right? And no, how they say don't. it. And oh, no, you don't. You really don't have to describe everything. You really do it minimal, minimally because okay. you want to give the actor the ability to feel and act. You don't want to tell them so much Maybe you'll get stage directions, but that's not even the screenwriters. That's really the director. So you're basically saying Jane and Lori talking on Zoom. And then you could just go on. Someone else is going to dress us. Someone else is going to, you know, do the, what the room looks like. So unless it's very important for your story, it's a simpler process. It's a lot about dialogue. When you write a book, you know, those, that 90 pages of a screenplay turns into 300 pages. And there's a reason for that. It's filled with description. Got it. That you're not seeing in a movie. Yeah. Yeah. I love but books are, where it's so like, you just feel like you're there, like the taste in the mouth and describing it all. And a lot of analogies of it felt like I was, you know, and it, it would describe something and I'm like, wow, that's, and vocabularies. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's, I would have to sit there with a dictionary because my vocabulary is pretty minimal, I think. It's pretty <laughs> basic. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Yes. I mean, and the metaphors and the similes, everything that goes into a novel is just much different than a screenplay. So they both, I enjoy writing both of them, but they're very different tasks. Yeah. Yeah. I guess you have to be very open as a script writer. For, open to change for changes, and, yes absolutely yeah. and I am pretty open and I was mm -hmm. always pretty open but I I mean I remember the first time I got fired from my very first screenplay the one day my attorney called me and he said James I just spoke to the lawyer at Miramax and he said you're the best screenwriter on st that we have right now you're the best one I'm like really that's crazy but okay the next day my same attorney called me back and he said Jane you've been fired <laughs> Oh, yesterday gosh. yesterday I was the best yeah so it's like a crazy place Hollywood yeah and editing, you know, writing, working with a book editor is has been delightful for me I've enjoyed every minute of it 
Yeah. And it, when you work with an editor, is it something that is it an arrangement that you find you find this editor or is it I mean, I know there's different ways because you can work with a publisher and imagine the publishers have edit editors on staff, but a lot of people don't have publishers that buy their books in advance. So how does that work when you get started? Well, since this podcast is about pivoting, I will tell you like the ways where it can work for someone that's listening that maybe wants to write a book or has written a book. I think it's very helpful if you've written a book to get an editor and work with them because you really want it. You have one shot when you turn that in to an agent or to a publishing house and that's it, that's your shot. So it should really be the best it can be. That being said, my story was much different. I sold, I sold my first novel, Nine Women, One Dress, without having an editor or having an agent. It was just an unusual circumstance and they asked me to get an agent. And then the publishing house matches you up with an editor that relates to your work. So it really goes to the editor. That's who chooses what gets published, the editors. Mm. Interesting. Mostly, usually. Yeah. So, so when you submit, for instance, your manuscript, the editors review them and then pick the ones that they like. Is that how it works? Yeah. Yeah. It's your agent. It's hard to get an agent, but you, you could query an agent and ask them to read your book. If mm -hmm. they take it on, they then submit it to editors at different publishing houses. They'll make a list. They'll look and say, oh, this editor looks like she likes this kind of story, things like that. And then those editors read tons of submissions and they choose who they want to work with and who they want to put on their list. It's a big deal because, you know, there's only so many days in a year, right? And only so many books one editor could actually edit. Right. Yeah. Read first. <laughs> and and read. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. They're doing both. My, yeah. My editor is excellent. She's, she actually has two number one New York Times bestsellers right now on her list, Emily Henry and Carly Fortune. So I feel like I'm in great hands with her. Good. That's great. Yeah. So let's go back in time because I'm always curious about, I mean, it, this feels to me like your passion and clearly you like writing. It's just a kind of a different way of writing. So yes. I, I have a daughter, one of my, I have two daughters, the youngest one, she used to write stories. She would, we had our, uh, comp, one of our first computers, it was an older computer, uh, but we put it in a, our furnace room because we didn't have any other place to put it. And we had a computer that, but she had her writing computer. And I said, okay, this old computer, we'll put it in the furnace room. And she would go down there and sit for hours writing stories on this computer. And she, as she grew up, she, she now works for a corporation as a content kind of coordinator writer. I, and I, it, you know, I don't see her feeling passionate, which makes me sad, but, but, you know, she's got to find her way, but she had these ideas. She even wrote an outline for a novel when she was, had graduated from college. Uh, and, and so I, I, when I think of people that find their passion, I think of like, what did they do? And I'm curious how that showed up when you were a child. So when I was a child, this is like my earliest writing memory. I was in the sixth grade and I had this, one of those teachers that had been in the school like forever, you know, old man who was obsessed with English and poetry and all of that. And he used to take my stories that I wrote for my assignments, read them, hand them back to me and ask me to go around the school and let other teachers read them, read the stories. So right then and there, I knew that this was my special, you know, thing, my talent. I think as a lot of people, what happens to a lot of people is I, I got waylaid when I got to college and you get concerned with how am I going to support myself and supporting yourself as a writer seems quite daunting. It is, it really is. So I went to the garment center. And I did something that I knew I would be able to support myself. And it wasn't until I had children and became a stay-at-home mom that I started writing again. So yes, I, 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 you know, I should have maybe followed that sixth grade kid that loved to write 
and I never really stopped loving to write, but life kind of got in the way. Yeah, that's it's great that you picked it back up, back up and you had the opportunity to do it. <clears throat> and what did that look like? I mean, did you just start writing stories or did you just like journal or because there's different ways to write? I was, my kids were in nursery school. We live in New York City. They went to the school called the 92nd Street Y. And if you know anything about New York City nursery school admissions, it's like a cutthroat, crazy thing that like I couldn't believe I found myself in the middle of. I mean, I'm from Long Island. I don't even remember where I went to nursery school. But in New York City, you know, it's like getting into Harvard to get into certain of these schools. So it was so funny to me that while I was at this nursery school, I started thinking about this, you know, about a movie, about a script. And it just kept coming to me and all these different things. The whole story just kept unfolding before my eyes. So I went and took a class at something called the Gotham Writers Workshop. I mean, anyone could take their classes. They're fantastic. And they have them online. This class was in the city, which was fun. You know, I went like one night a week for 10 weeks. It was a fun night away from my three little kids. And it was um, where I learned how to write a screenplay. And it was a great experience. Highly recommend anyone who's pivoting and thinking of a new career to just jump into a class to get started doing mm -hmm. anything. I don't know, pottery, writing, cooking, whatever it is, because it's a real motivator. And um, I wrote the script and sold it. And that was how I got back into it. And once just once I sold it, you know, that was it. Yeah. So that like, was your first one that you sold? Yeah. That's great. And then it sometimes so things are sold, but they don't, nothing happens to them, right? They can sit and collect dust and yeah. They don't sit and collect dust with the screenplay. <laughs> I rewrote that thing like 30 times for Miramax. They optioned it three different times. The same script got optioned by two other people. Wow. An option is like renting it. And so it just never got made. Really why I wrote Nine Women, One Dress as a book was so that it would get made into a movie because I just saw that was what was happening. Books become TV shows now. Yes. So often. Yeah. I such told, a good point. Yeah, I sold my second novel, Eliza Starts a Rumor, recently to Universal. Um, the first one I sold to Hallmark. So I think there's just a much greater chance yeah. of seeing something on the big or small screen if you write it as a book in this environment. Yeah, do you think so, one of the reasons is because they can see book sales and they can see the interest? And if it's, they're high, there's high interest or is there no correlation? I don't know. I mean, there's a correlation if you're really in the top, top. I'm not like in the top, top of my field. I mean, I'm sure Colleen Hoover, you know, her, one of her books is being made into a film right now. And I'm sure every Colleen Hoover fan, which there are millions of, will run to see it. Um, I hope that mine, you know, would garner interest, but I think it's more about them having a good story that's already loved and made, you know, created. Mm -hmm. and turning it into a television series. Yeah, do you think, I feel like there's a much greater opportunity for actors and actresses. I always think of this from an actor and actor's perspective, but obviously there's other people that work on movies besides mm -hmm. them. But I think about the Netflix and the Hulu and the Amazon Prime and a lot of these shows or these channels, cable networks that are, if that's what you call them, but they're, they're creating original content. And so there's a lot of options now, it seems. And so do you find that it's easier now or, or there's a lot more people maybe doing what you're doing too? No, I don't think there's, I mean, I think people have always been writing books and um, I, well, right now there's a television strike. So I think it's not easy for anybody, but in general, I, it's really the second golden age of television right now. Like, as you said, with there's so many streamers like Netflix and Apple all doing this original stuff. And I mean, if you think about it, what did you have before? You know, when we were young, when you had NBC, ABC, CBS, PBS. Yep. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's it. Yep. So I can imagine that must have been nearly impossible to get something on television compared to now. Yeah. Yeah. This, yeah. It's, I just find myself too being like, it's, they're never enough. It's like, I want something good tonight. You know, it's, it's like a lot of consuming, but yes. yeah. Yeah. And so can you tell me a little bit about your book? So you said you had this, I was very curious when I heard the title, 
nine women, one dress. And I thought, well, I wonder if they shared a dress because we do that in college. (laughs) Um, That's my first novel, Nine Women, One Dress. It's, It's the story of one dress of Bloomingdale's and nine different women that wear that one single dress. So they returned it. They wore it and then returned it. Oh, uh, they did not return it. You have to read it to find oh, out. Oh, I will. <laughs> I've been to Bloomies in New York, so I can, I can picture myself going in there. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. It was that was a hard book to write. I had a, I had a calendar of where that dress was on every day. It said where the dress was because it was hard to keep track of it. My next novel, Eliza Starts a Rumor, is set in the Hudson Valley, and that's about It's about a community of women that find each other and help each other through some tough times, all kind of precipitated by this rumor that went on. And that's the one that is going to be hopefully a television show. Um, The third book, it's called A Shoe Story, which is more of a second coming of age, finding yourself kind of story about a girl that comes to New York for one month and what happens to her. And my latest book on Fire Island is really my favorite child, I should say. And um, it's is that also, the one you said was your first script that you returned into a book or? This, you... yes, it was okay. a script. It was actually with Harvey Weinstein when everything went down with him. And um, I waited to write those other three books to write this book. The reason it's so close to my heart is because we live on Fire Island when we're Mm -hmm. not in New York City. So the place itself is very close to me and I wanted to do it justice. And the book, it's going to sound sad, but it's actually very uplifting. And I've received so many letters thanking me for how uplifting it is, is about a woman who passes away at age 37 and spends one last summer almost as a spirit with her husband in Fire Island. Um, but it's funny and it's uplifting and it's my most beautiful story that I've ever written, honestly. And where'd you get the idea? I know you spent a lot of time there, you said. Yeah. yeah. It's so hard to say because it's so not one idea in this book. It's just multiple ideas, multiple character studies. I spend a lot of time at the baseball fields, which is near my house watching the guys play ball and playing ball myself and watching my kids play ball. And a lot of this book comes from those guys on the baseball field um, and their quirkiness and all of that. And it's a love story. So some of it is based on my own love, my marriage and my husband and just, you know, a long time love affair, I guess. And it's unlike other stories where I could really pinpoint where it came from. There's not like a, a distinct spark. It's kind yeah. of like a collection. So how do you, how do you, like a lot of times I have ideas, but I never smart enough to write them down. I like, I, I, I'm like, Oh, I'll remember that. And a lot of them come in the middle of the night or like, as I'm waking up in the morning. And, and so I always say to myself, I need to put a journal, but then it's dark. And then I don't want to turn my light on because I don't want to wake up my husband. So it's like, it, it, it never gets done. So do you, are you, do you have like a little note thing in your phone that you're constantly putting your ideas in? Do you have like talk to yourself in your phone? How do you, how do you not lose? Cause it sounds like you're constantly coming up with creative ideas. First of all, it's no accident that it's the middle of the night or first thing in the morning that you think of something because that is when your brain is just much clearer than, you know, once it starts getting bogged down with what you have to do on your to-do list and what are you having for dinner and, you know, this and that, it's just not as clear. I, um, I, I write in the notes on my phone and if it's the middle of the night, you're not going to remember it. That's the first thing I'll say. You could say to yourself, I'm going to remember this, but you're not going to remember it. And you could sit, if I don't write it down and I'm trying to fall back to sleep, I'm just repeating that thought over and over and over in my head (laughs) because I don't want to forget it. And it's, I'm never going to fall asleep because I'm too busy saying this sentence in my head. So I write it down. And yes, I do it all the time. I do it on the subway. I, I do it everywhere I am. I'm always thinking, hearing, overhearing, you know, witnessing something that I want to write down, even if it's a funny word. 
Uh, it's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. Just the v- words that you hear that you're like, oh, that that's that's a powerful word. Yeah. That's- I have a category in my notes that just says words. Oh, yeah. yeah. And just thinking of the word can give you an idea. I love Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Or even just funny things that come into your head and then I'll put them in a book. I'll look, you know, something yeah. my, my daughter said something the other day that was so funny. And I said, I'm stealing that. And I wrote it down and I'll put it in a book, you know? Oh, that's great. So how yeah. old are your kids now? You said you had three? 30, 27 and 24. Wow. Three daughters. Are they launched? <laughs> I mean, I, used, I, launched. Think you, I I read that you like come, come home sometimes. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. They come home sometimes. That's true. Well, especially when you have a house at the beach, they all come home sometimes. Um, my oldest is 30. She's becoming a canter, which is pretty neat. That was a big pivot during COVID. She switched what she was doing. My middle one is in documentary film school. And my youngest one wants to become a doctor. She's at Columbia during her post batch before applying to medical school. So they're all on their way. What kind of doctor does she want to be? Right now she works at Bellevue in addiction medicine, which Mm. is very interesting. And in a public hospital in New York City, you could imagine. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's a needed field right now. Yeah. 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 Especially after COVID. (laughs) Really is tough, but maybe she'll continue with that. Maybe she won't. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's a vast field. So many options. Yes. All three of them have very different career paths. Yeah. So tell me when you actually made the pivot, I think I read that you were 50, was around 50. And so was it just because you said you were waiting for an idea to come to you? How did that happen? How can you describe, like, was it in this moment, like in the middle of the night, like you're describing where you get ideas or... Was it a gradual thing? You talked about going to a class to learn screenwriting when you were interested in that. Was there anything that was like, oh, I'm going to be a novelist? It's interesting. I, um, I came up with the idea just simply when someone told me the story about a dress being returned to Bloomingdale's with formaldehyde on it. And I worked backwards from there. The reason I sat down, though, and really wrote this book is quite interesting. My youngest daughter became very ill when she was in high school. She had something called POTS and it made her faint or like vomit. She would vomit in between classes. She would faint, you know, just walking around, just faint in the middle of school. And she started being able to figure out when she was going to faint. But the stress of me being all the way uptown and across town in New York City, she went to LaGuardia High School, which is the fame school. Mm. So she that fact of me like rushing to get her because when she faints I'd have to pick her up was really giving her anxiety so I said to her you know what you go to school I'm gonna sit at the library across the street and I'm gonna write that novel I've always wanted to write oh I just got chills Uh uh-huh wow in the library every day and I wrote the novel And when she didn't feel well, I just had to cross the street and it really helped her. It really gave her the confidence that she wasn't disrupting everyone's lives. And um, it was an amazing experience. Uh, The New York City public libraries are filled with quite an interesting group of people (laughs) wanting to use the computers and read the magazines and and there's movie days on Tuesdays. And it was, it was very interesting experience. And I actually wrote most of that novel in that library, which is another good example of pivoting and of also just not letting life's bad things, which there are always going to be bad things, right? You you know, you can't wait for the perfect time to do something. So was it the perfect time to write a novel? Probably not because my head was so caught up in my daughter's illness did it give me an escape? And did I end up writing it? Yes. So like, you know, you really shouldn't wait. You shouldn't wait for everything to align to begin what it is that makes you happy. Just, Mm. just do it. Yeah. You turn something bad into something good. Yeah, I did. That's amazing. And I think as you pointed out, it helped your daughter. 
it helped my daughter and it really helped me because I wasn't thinking about her all the time. You know, I mean, once you start writing, I mean, the same could be said of reading also. You, you get thrown into someone else's world and you, it gives you an escape. Yeah. Yeah. And I wonder if she thinks, you know, that book might not have been written if it weren't for me and my difficulty that I went through. Is she doing well now? Doing great. She's doing great. She's amazing. Thank you. Always, um, always knows when a faint's coming, long. probably, right? <laughs> I'm a fainter when I have medical things. So oh. I, 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 I'm really good at like knowing when it's coming on. I've only signs. fainted every time I was pregnant. I fainted once. Oh, I fainted on the subway the first time I was pregnant on the escalator. Could you imagine? Ooh. That's but like New York. I would, so I'd be wonderful. so worried I get sucked into the thing. Of course. Yeah. By the time I got off and really dropped, I couldn't see a thing. I, my eyes were like, but New Yorkers were so wonderful. I, I woke up and there was this huge tattooed man. I was in his arms on the floor. <laughs> I'll never forget. I saw the arms covered in tattoos. And I was like, thank you so much for catching me. Did and you know I you were fainted. pregnant or was that? Yeah, I, I was oh, okay. pregnant. Yeah. And I fainted in my um, shrimp and lobster sauce at Mr. Chow's restaurant <laughs> on the Upper East Side. Is and that in a like, book? Is that little episode no, in a book? I, almost ha I haven't thought about it in years, but I did. I said to my husband, I think I'm going to faint. And I just went. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Uh, yeah. Did that but end now. your nice meal? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it did. It did. Oh, that's so funny. I, I fainted when I got my first mammogram because like, it's a fear. It's like, what are they doing? Oh my God. But I knew. So she caught me before. How could you faint during a mammogram? You're like locked in. Attached. I know she was <laughs> right behind me. So like, and then I fainted during a pedicure once with, I had my toes worked on and it started bleeding. So yeah, I fainted with shots. I fainted with drawing blood when I was pregnant. It's, wow. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite a, it's, it's, it's a problem. <laughs> Probably be a book about it, but. <laughs> so, so, so one of the things, cause I think writers have a special gift and that what I think of them is, you know, I've learned about these 10 types of work, like what's in your DNA, what kind of work lights you up. And, and my, my work that lights me up most I found is being an advisor and a, and a teacher, whereas some people are makers and makers like to make things. And so writers very often are makers because they're ma making a book. They're creating very creative people. And so what do you, because I think that everybody has a story in them. Like a, everybody should write at least a memoir of something in their life, I think. I think it's cathartic, number one. So for somebody who maybe isn't like the maker, I mean, it doesn't come as naturally. It's not like a gift that they're just like, oh, they're like always having these ideas and writing them down. What would you say to somebody who has a desire? Because I have a desire to write a book, but it's not like something that I'm super passionate about that I want to like spend all my time doing, but I feel like I have a message that I want to share and I have stories that I want to tell. What would I say? How do you start? Meaning like what? Well, you yeah. Know? How do you, how do you, yeah, I guess. What would you well, recommend all, to somebody who has a desire, but not really an all consuming one? Cause I think if you have an all consuming one, go for it, just start it. But if it's, right. you've got a number of things and you're like, oh, this is always in the back of my mind kind of thing. Start writing, hmm. you know, start writing, give yourself a little wake up in the morning and start writing. I don't know if you, if you have to be at work at 10, wake up a little earlier and, and write for an hour before you know it, you're going to have so many pages down mm. and, and you're going to see, wow, this is a possibility. Then once I started doing that, if, if I would feel like it was going to go somewhere, I would then look into local classes. Um, like I said, Gotham Writers Workshop, there's uh, Zibby, Zibby Owens is a big, you could find her on Instagram. She, she's a big um, book influencer and podcaster. Zibby as in Z-I-B-B-Y? Z-I-B-B-Y. Okay. And she has classes that seem to be excellent. Um, yeah, I would get into a, a workshop or a class or something just to get you started. I'm not saying you have to write your whole book with them. I'm not saying mm -hmm. go get your MFA. 
But I think it's inspiring to hear other people's work, to read your work to other people, to see, you know, what direction you could take it and get different opinions. And it's a great way to start anything. Like I said before, yeah. I mean, you were going to bake it. You were going to become a baker and you didn't know how to bake, you know, you'd have to learn. So yeah. writing, you can learn. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Did you have writing buddies? I mean, I imagine you could, and if you do some kind of a, a course, there'd be other students that you could connect with as well. I did all those things for screenwriting. Mm. To be honest, when I was writing this book, I just literally was, you know, in, in deep with my daughter's illness. And I just sat down and wrote it. I didn't take a class. I didn't do anything. I just sat down and wrote it. How do you not be critical of what you're writing? Because I think that that happens with a, a lot of us and particularly me who kind of a perfectionist of my, in my life, trying to recover from that, but like always like reading what I wrote and judging it before I even get very far in it. If that's your issue, then don't go backwards, keep going forwards. In other words, write like nobody's reading it, write without judgment and you'll fix it all when you go to edit it. And you should be critical when you're editing. You should be very critical. I mean, I remember when I wrote Nine Women, One Dress being my first book that how I looked at every sentence and every chapter over and over again, you know, to make sure I was satisfied with it. I still do that, but I'm not as crazy as I was then. So you would just but let something flow out of you? Absolutely, right? Like, it, and if you get stuck on something, I don't stop. I put some X's, X, 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 right in the middle of whatever I'm writing. And I just keep going. That's a great idea. I mean, especially if you're on a, if you're on a roll and things are flowing out of you, but then you get stuck on a word. Don't, you know, don't bother. Yeah. Deadly. And did you use traditional like pen and paper, pencil and paper? Or did you like type? Cause I know a lot of people type. Type. I would. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> green writing, it would be almost impossible not to, there's a bunch of, um, software you know there's different software for screenwriters because it's really it's very specific you have to have it exactly written the correct way like uh the, the character the dialogue the the setting everything is in different forms in a screenplay so I was very used to writing on the computer because of that you know what I'm saying like yeah. so when I started writing the novel I just plus spell check yeah a that's a good color. point too because you'd have to put it all in to a yeah. document at some, some point or another. Of course. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Good point. When um, I first yeah. screen, you had to print them out. You had to bind them with these little silver screws and send them out to be read. Now you just email and your document. Yeah. I, w I was interviewing an author once and she, her first manuscript, she lost it. She like lost it in, on her drive everything yeah and she she had to start it all over again I always think you do it but you know something is better the second time around but can you imagine like investing all that time and then losing it so no. if you start back it up <laughs> <laughs> you know it's like it's a lot being an author I think is a lot like being in college because you always have a paper to first of all it's like you always have yes. a to. you're not even if you're out and about it's in the back of your mind that you have this paper due just the same way it was in college. You know? And I You're hated like, that. I, I still have dreams about that. Something I just do. <laughs> it's the worst part about yeah. it. I think You're just never yeah. really free and clear. Yeah. But it's worth it. So, so I, of course the name of this podcast is living your sparked second half. Sounds like you've been pretty sparked your whole life, <laughs> but would you, on a degree of being sparked, how is it different now versus then maybe? I think that my kids are out of the house. So I think that makes a huge difference. Um, I think I feel very fulfilled. And I think I'm a little bit more conscious of every aspect of my life, like of my health and of eating better and of putting exercise into my life. And then of course the writing, I think that the, one of the fun things about this second act is that I never realized that I liked public speaking. But when you're an author, you talked about being a maker. Well, now authors really have to not just be a maker. You have to be a marketer. 
and a social media expert, and you have to be able to speak in front of people. Yeah, because, that's a performer. That's a, that. Yeah, you know. Yeah, that's a performer role or a whole work. Yeah. different thing. Yeah. So that's a whole. You know, talk about a spark, a second half. I mean, sometimes I talk in front of a thousand people about my book. That's exciting. And I, you know, maybe nervous beforehand, but once I get up there, I kind of like it. I like talking to readers. I like love answering questions. So that was news to me, you know, that I would be able to do that. Yeah. Fun, fun. So what is up your sleeve for next? Mm-hmm. Are you working on something? Oh, yeah, I'm yeah. guessing you are because everything's published. <laughs> yeah. My next book is called Seven Summer Weekends, and it's also set on Fire Island, and that'll be out next year. Um, I'm touring with On Fire Island, going on a bunch of, you know, book chats and Zooms and podcasts and all of that. And I think if I had to pick something that I would really love to do that's kind of out of my comfort zone, I really want to write a play, not a screenplay, an actual stage play. So I'm kind of toying with that idea. Yeah. How is that different than a screenplay? I mean, I would guess you'd be pretty involved in the production. Like, I mean, with this, are you thinking Broadway? I mean, probably off Broadway, but I guess it's different because if you think about it, it's just set on a stage, right? Mm -hmm. So a screenplay or a book, you could go anywhere. So you kind of have to, I don't know. I've never done it. You know, I don't really know how it's different. I'll have to come back after I've written it. (laughs) <laughs> yeah so, yeah you will I love that yeah. I love that yeah always working on something and and that it'll never end too that's the cool thing the it's ideas the thing never end happy, right I mean yeah it's just it's only, you know you find something that makes you happy it could be a pickleball but writing is what makes me happy yeah yeah I love that yeah that's what I try to tell people is uh just like do something different like try something different. If you're feeling stale, if you're feeling stuck, just put something on your calendar that's totally different. You know, try yeah. to have fun. What whatever was fun, maybe when you were younger, or maybe it's something you wanted to do that you never did, or whatever. But I love your idea of just taking a class in something. Yes, definitely. And I have two friends, two really good friends that I introduced years ago that found themselves, you know, the kids left and they were really floundering with what to do. And they opened up a pocketbook company. They import Italian pocketbooks or bags, whatever you call them. It's called Two Amici's, which is adorable because mm-hmm. they're two friends. And they've been doing great. And it's like, they just work and came up with it. And it's a whole new second act for them. And it's fantastic. That's fun. So it's really anything that you love, you know? Yeah. You could do a second act. Yeah, that's so cool. I saw that you're in, you're mostly in the New York area touring. I saw that one of the places you're going, it caught my eye because it's in Kismet, New York. And Kismet means fate. It's actually the name of one of my modules in my program because I think that uh, I was looking for something to start with a K to go with Spark. But um, Kismet to me is like, you're, you're, you're here to do this. You're, you know, you're, you, there is a reason you're here. And when you feel this spark and you're passionate about something, it's your kismet. So I think yes. it's so cool that you're going to be in a city named that. No, not, well, it's not really a city. It's funny that you say that. It's on Fire Island. Oh, so kismet Fire, is? Yes. Fire oh. Island is a very narrow island. I mean, you could see the ocean and the bay from, if you're standing in the middle, you see them both. It's so narrow, but it's long. So there's 17 different communities and there are no cars. So the communities don't really mesh and they end up with these distinct personalities. So I'm touring on Fire Island to a bunch of different towns to do book talks and it's going to be fun. It's in August. And, oh, that's um, so neat. How, yeah, how big is it? Of, it must be big. I think 23 miles long. Wow. Mm-hmm. That is yeah. so cool. How did it it's get the perfect. name? Do you have any idea? Kismet, probably from what no. you just said. The, no, the Fire Island. How did it get? Oh, Fire Island. Yeah. So it's funny. The beginning of my book, they, there's all different ideas about it. Some people say it's because the Dutch word for four, for five, no, for four is fire. And it was used to be four different islands that then came together with, in time. Some people say it's because the pirates, there were pirates living on the island and moonshiners. And the pirates used to build fires so that boats would come. Oh. to the island and then they would 
pirate, you know, yeah. the worst, the pirate do. yes. So that was another reason why they think it's called fire Island, but it's not a definite answer. There's no oh, that's interesting. Answer. But it's, it's a really interesting place. And I talk about it at the beginning of my book. I mean, there's been tons of actors and directors and artists living on the island. So many authors, so many authors. You wouldn't believe it. Well, I, I can mean, see why. It seems Tiffany's like it's, yeah. was written yeah. on Fire Island. Oh. And, yes. And um, tons, so many. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I've, I've not heard of, I mean, I've heard of Fire Island, but I've never heard you know, just I've heard it, but I didn't know what it was. And it sounds like something that definitely should be on my list to visit. It's of a US, U.S. places. Yeah. yeah, people, you get off the ferry boat. It's a half hour ferry ride from the mainland. You take your own wagon that you have locked up in the little wagon park and you put your groceries or whatever it is, your bags. I mean, you don't really have to bring anything because everyone wears the same like cut off jean shorts and t-shirt the whole summer anyway. But um, you pull your stuff back to your house. There's one little market in town where everyone socializes. It takes you an hour to get a sandwich because you're so busy talking up everybody there. And it's a really magical place. And I guess golf carts are the way to get around or walk. Oh no, what even like Golf carts are basically not really even allowed in my town unless you're a worker that, you know, needs a golf cart. You walk and you ride bicycles. And ride bicycles. Wow. Sounds so neat. Yes. It's really neat. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. What? It's great. You could visit it in my book if you don't get to visit it. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Makes me want to read your book. Yes. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for sharing your story and your journey. I know it's going to inspire people to at least get started writing in some way, even if they're not a maker. (laughs) I I think, you know, it's, I I have somebody coming on my podcast soon and she does this uh, program called Memory Maker. She teaches people how to make memories with their elderly loved ones. And it's just like, it's such an example of like, it's great that you have these books because your kids will always have these books of yours that you created but like mm-hmm. everybody can write down their stories, it, you know, they can invent stories or they can embellish their own or they can create theirs. And I, I don't know, I feel really passionate about um, keeping records of, of your life. I, I, it's great now that we have social media because you can look back in your, your, your feed and see those crazy things you did. But uh, yeah, uh, there's a lot that has been lost, you know, with my grandparents and mm. I just searched um, on Veterans Day, my grandfather was a general. And so I did a search on the internet and I learned something about my grandfather that I never knew. I was like, what? I, like, I, you know, he died when I was very young. I was, well, I wasn't that young, but I was young enough that I wasn't interested in like asking him questions. I was like 23. And, and uh, so I, I just think there's a lot of stories we have that should be lost. Yeah, so I, my, my last book, uh, A Shoe Story, is filled with stories about my dad and my mom. Aww. My dad was in World War II and the Coast Guard. His whole journey is in that book. It's pretty interesting. Oh, what a treasure. Well, thank you so much. Keep up the good work, doing what you thanks. do. And thanks, thanks for, for having me. Okay. Have a good summer. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning into the Living Your Spark Second Half podcast. If you'd like to watch my guest interviews, you can find the video version of this podcast on my Not Your Average Grandma YouTube channel. Also, you can check out what I have going on at the moment by going to my website at notyouraveragegrandma.com or find me on Instagram or Facebook at Not Your Average Grandma. If you like this episode, please mention it to a friend and don't forget to leave a review so I know the topics you like best and can bring you more of that content in upcoming episodes. Last but not least, Remember to always listen to that inner voice that will never steer you wrong and make living from the most sparked place possible your biggest priority. When we do that, we make the world a better place.